Now, there is a hospital called the Hanneman Homeopathic Hospital in Philadelphia. 67,000 patients were treated there with homeopathy. Most of them, greater than 90%, were treated with gelsemia. And then the rest, the smaller percentage, were treated with bryonia and eupatorium perfoliatum. Interestingly, that's a lot of people, 67,000 patients, and there are only three remedies. But that's how it worked out. And in the book that I've prepared to go with my DVD, uh, there's a book also floating around here somewhere called What to Do About the Flu. It's about 100 pages, and it is uh, the transcript of the DVD of the same name. But also, I got a chance to take the articles from 1918 and reprint them in there. So if you want to read articles by medical doctors written between 1918 and 1921, they're in there, and they talk about the use of homeopathic remedies. So one other little thing about 1918 and the Hanneman Homeopathic Hospital in Philadelphia. A certain number of their patients died of the flu. 1.5%. A certain number of patients died of the flu under regular medical care. 30%. Same town. So it's, it's such a dramatic difference that you have to look at homeopathy as a way to treat these problems. So with gelsinium, those, those are just the normal flu symptoms. Fever, nausea, vomiting, maybe some diarrhea. But the differentiation for bryonia, why you might want to give that, the main symptoms are they're worse from any movement. So this is the person who lays in bed and they don't even want to move an inch because it makes them feel worse. Like maybe their nausea gets worse or something like that. So any movement, and their mucous membranes are dry, which makes me think about having a drink of water right now. So if you see those two symptoms, worse from movement, mucous membranes are all dry, that's a case of bryonia flu. And the third one, eupatorium perfoliatum, um, that primary symptom is bone pain. Like right? they ache as you do with the flu, but the ache is very deep in the bones. So then the next thing to think about, now that you know the three homeopathic remedies, what about herbs? I gave a lecture, in fact a DVD comes from a lecture I gave in June, and there were 60 people there, and I said, okay, so now we're going to talk about herbs. What's the herb for the flu? I think everybody said Lomatia. Everyone in the room knew it. So there's an educated audience. That's the KGEZ deal, I guess. Everybody gets educated. That's wonderful. So the herb is Lomatia dissectum. Grows everywhere around here. Um, I decided to hand make some, uh, even though it's a lot of work compared to just going down to Tom's shop, Tom Tracy's shop, and buying it. But I wanted to try making it. So my wife and I went out and in about five minutes collected enough for a half a gallon of Lomation. We were taking drop doses, right? So half a gallon is a lot. Um, but it's a very common herb here. And again, go back to 1918. What happened with Lomation? There was a medical doctor in Arizona, Dr. Krebs. And he had occasion to observe two Indian tribes, one that was using Lomation for the flu, one that was not using Lomation. In the Lomation group, about a one, no, the Lomation group had 0% death rate. And the people who were not using it, the Indian tribe that wasn't using it, 30% death rate. And that's dramatic. So that should be in your medicine chest for sure. Uh, colloidal silver is the other thing. Now, I don't recommend colloidal silver on a daily basis, but I do recommend it when you get an infection. A lot of other people are saying, oh, you know, protect yourself all the time, and I think that's okay, but I don't think it's totally necessary. Um, but on the other hand, if you get an infection, you should be taking colloidal silver. I have some old 
um, very old medical books about old drugs. One of those uh, books was printed by the American Medical Association in 1917. And in there, they have Lomatium as an injectable liquid, Lomatium as a cream, I mean, I'm sorry, um, uh, colloidal silver as a cream, colloidal silver as an injection. They use colloidal silver all the time back then before the age of antibiotics. Right, so that was their main antibiotic back before uh, in the 1940s when people actually started to use antibiotics. Colloidal silver is much safer, much cheaper, and uh, also uh, thinking about public health measures with the flu, you got to wash your hands all the time. I don't care what Dr. Deagle says, I'll argue with him as much as he wants to argue, you have to do that. It's just common sense. Also, you need to have a mask. I have a friend who just came back from, from Brazil, came through Brazil. Uh, in Sao Paulo, uh, so last Sunday, I think it was, um, everybody who worked at the airport in Sao Paulo had a mask on. So they are worried about it down there a little bit. That wasn't true in every city he went through, but he said Sao Paulo was like a hospital down there. What kind of mask? Say again? What kind of mask? Oh, those N95 masks that are around, those are fine. You know, you just need something that's going to filter out the viral material so you just don't get coughed directly on. And one thing that's very important, and I have seen the opposite of this suggested other places, so I want to make sure you get this, don't use aspirin with the flu. They did that in 1918, and most of those people died. Uh, there's a thing called RACE, RISE syndrome that arises if you take aspirin, particularly in children, if you take aspirin with a viral infection. So, no aspirin, even if you take it at other times. <laughs> Vaccinations. Well, we already talked about what to do if the flu comes to town, right? The things you can do to protect yourself. So my opinion about vaccinations is I don't recommend them at all, for any reason. Um, and I have to say that I'm entitled to my medical opinion, and that's it. So that's what I tell all patients who come in, young mothers, uh, you know, people for yearly physicals and thinking about getting a seasonal flu shot. I just don't recommend any of that to anyone. The last time I took a vaccination was in 1976, when they forced vaccinated everyone in my hospital. Uh, they just came around and said, take the vaccine or go away. Well, of course, I didn't know any of this information back then when I was a kid. So I ended up taking the vaccine. I didn't die, as you can see. Uh, I didn't feel well, though. Um, and a lot of people got quite sick from, from that vaccine. But what happens if that happens to you now? Well, I still would recommend not taking a vaccination, no matter what. But that might not always be true for everyone. So there's a homeopathic remedy, Thuya, that's been used for what's called vaccinosis, which is the illness that comes up, the side effects that come up from having a, a foreign organism injected into your body. So how do we know that Thuya works? I've heard homeopathy be dismissed out of hand, like, oh, I wouldn't rely on that. Well. In 1885, well, let's go back farther. In the 1790s is when vaccines started, right? Jenner took the, uh, from a cow, he took a pock that uh, the, these milkmaids used to get these cow pox on their hands from milking. He took the material from that and injected it into a kid, uh, and supposedly he was protected from smallpox, and that's how the whole thing got started. Um, so vaccinations have been around a long time, 1790s, that was a long time ago. But in 1885, a medical doctor whose name is Compton Burnett wrote a book called Vaccinosis and Its Treatment by Thuya. 